Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, Book of Revelation. Regardless of what language you wish to say it in, it means the uncovering, the unveiling. And in the first lecture, we covered chapter 1, and the 10th verse is something you want to remember because we were taken in the Spirit to the Lord's Day, which is to say the millennium. Therefore, to be shown things that would happen just before the first day of the millennium and things that would happen after the first day of the millennium. So we're going to be talking to seven about seven churches that are written in. Don't forget where we are. It's not today. We're taken to the first day of the millennium. And it looks back to the churches not in 95 A.D., but just before that great day of the Lord, that's now. So if your church um, teaches as one of these seven, two of them you're fortunate because the Father was pleased with them. And if your church is not teaching what those two churches that Christ was pleased with, then you're in a heap of hurt because you have a double witness because both of those churches teach basically the same thing. The other five do not. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand what pleases God, and if you want his blessings, you better be well pleased him. Now, we know that in the book of Revelation, God will use symbolism. And he gave us seven candlesticks and, and um, seven stars. And then God himself interpreted the meaning of those. Therefore, you don't touch it. If God interprets something, that's the end of the story. That's what it is. Man had better not hanky with it or, or try to change it to something different. So he has told us that the stars were the seven angels to the churches. And the, chur the candlesticks, the seven candlesticks that he used, he interpreted that also. He said, they, they, are, they symbolize the churches themselves. And you can always use the analogy when God uses symbolism. Wh wh why a candlestick for a church? Well, it's, it's supposed to give light. Okay. It's supposed to have life. That means fire, burning. And it's supposed to enlighten your soul. It's supposed to make you feel good because it reflects the light from Almighty God, the Father of light. So... Um, this, it's a beautiful thing to study the Word of God. And it's even more beautiful when you listen to God because He interprets this for us where a child can understand. So today we come to the letter to the churches. And again, I must remind you, it's a very difficult thing, but you've got to go to the Lord's Day. And we look back to now and on ahead, not back to 96 A.D. Okay. So... Here we go with it. Chapter 2, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. We're in the Lord's day, and these are seven means spiritual completeness. These churches were in a circle. They're said to be in Asia, the known populated world at that time, and it means everybody today. What does your church teach? You might pay attention. Verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus means permitted. Right. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars, that's those seven angels, in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He's in charge. He's got the keys to death and hell. It's Christ himself giving us the uncovering, the apocalypse, letting us know what tomorrow brings. In charge. And... Um, and he sends, what is an angel? It's a messenger. Going to tell you wh what he thinks. Verse 2. I know thy works, speaking of Ephesus, that church, 
in thy labor, that's good, and thy patience, that's good, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. You know the Kenites, who they are, but um, and it would seem that you can spot a false one pretty far away. That's, that's good. Verse 3, And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. You hang in there real tough. So far, so good. That, that's, that's, that's doing it right. Verse 4, Nevertheless, uh-oh, here it comes. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Now, this kind of lets you know, again, come with me to the Lord's Day. You take a church that's working right at it right up to the last minute, I mean, they're hanging in there tough. If they've never been taught that the Antichrist is coming first, you could understand how they lose their, left their first love. That's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And false teaching from within can cause one to leave that first love and go to the fake if you're not careful. Real easy, just, just that quick. If uh, you, can, you can sit in that church pew and listen to men uh, telling you how you should do this good and that good and so forth and avoid evil, but if you still bow down to the Antichrist, you left your first love. Not good. Verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, because they have fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That's a pretty serious charge. How would you like to belong to that church? Hey, they did everything pretty well right. They went through the motion. But going through the motion doesn't cut it unless you have the light, the truth, th because the deception is coming. This church will be deceived. Many of the members, not all necessarily, but many of them will be deceived. Never leave your first love. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't leave him for instead of Christ, which is to say Antichrist. Verse 6, But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You at least do hate uh, Baal worship. But Baal worship um, and um, a thing of immortality, immorality is one thing, but worshiping the Antichrist, that's something else, okay? That just, um, uh, you're no longer a spiritual virgin waiting for the great wedding. You've been had. Don't let man deceive you. This book of Revelation, this uncovering, takes you to that Lord's day and lets you know what you should be doing. Verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. What is the tree of life? The tree of life is the first love. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the life giver, the giver of eternal life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I mean, he's right there. He's on the throne, and he's there to represent us against the world. And um, you want to make sure that you are attuned to and you stay in contact with the tree of life, not the tree of good and evil. That's the fake, and the fake is coming. I think our Father is good to us that he uses terminology that you go back to the beginning and understand how it was in the beginning, and you'll know how it is here in the end. Verse 8, And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, These things which, thou, which the first... These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. He's very much with the second advent. Lord's days here. Got it? Now, Smyrna means myrrh, what, it, what the word actually means, but it's a fig. And right along, the parable of the fig tree runs right with this. And, and you should be very familiar with it. 
Jesus in Mark 13 didn't say, maybe you should get around to learning the fig tree. He said, learn it. No ifs, ands, or buts. Learn it. And really, you should know you're a little bit of a heap of, uh, it's a heap of hurt not to understand the simplicity that lies in the parable of the fig tree. Verse 9, I know thy works, speaking to the church of, Epha, uh, to, of Smyrna, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, this is one of the churches that Christ finds no fault with. Does your church teach this? Does your church teach who those are that claim to be of our brother Judah and do lie but are of the synagogue of Satan? If it doesn't, you're set up for deception. That is to say, the false Christ coming first, as you're going to find out in this book of Revelation. You see, he comes at the sixth trump, the fate does. The true Christ doesn't return until the seventh. Regardless of what some man might tell you, that's what the Word of God states, okay? So, uh, and there you have it. You know, how can we know them? You know, our true brother Judas suffers a great deal of hurt because of people misunderstanding this. And, um, and you should understand it because Jesus himself would tell us at one time exactly what he meant by this. Who are those of the synagogue of Satan that claim to be of our brother Judah? You need to be able to follow them in Christ's teachings as well as the Old Testament. It's quite simple. And we go to St. John chapter 8. I want to pick it up with verse 42. So you need to know this is the church that Christ is pleased with, and this is the information that they teach and have knowledge of. Verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. He, I'm, I'm on that mission as Emmanuel, God with us. He sent me, and you're not accepting me. Verse 43, why do you not understand my speech? Question. It's simple. Child can understand it. Why can't you? Even because you cannot hear my word. They don't have ears to hear. I guess the question is, do you? I mean, these are the teachings of Jesus Christ, not man. If you don't hear the words of Christ, and it, with understanding, you kind of have a problem you need to listen to Christ. What does he say then? Verse 44, he answers. Verse 44 reads, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. I'll give you one guess. Who was the first murderer? Ask a five-year-old child. They'll tell you. It was Cain, of course. And Cain's offspring are what? Kenites. And you can trace them throughout the Word of God. First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, they were already doing scribeship for the tribe of Judah, of whom so many of them claim to be, as it's written in Jeremiah chapter 35. Um, he was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So you don't have to wonder. Jesus made it very clear who this synagogue of Satan was, where the false Christ would come from. All you have to do is watch the followers of that um, ilk of, of 1 Corinthians 2, verse 55, and follow them throughout the Word of God. They're, this is what Jesus would teach concerning the tares. The devil is the one that planted the wicked seed, which is to say the Kenites. Jesus teaches it. I, did you know that? It's written. It's very plain in the Word of God. And, and uh, there for you to absorb, to see, to understand, and most of all, to believe. And to believe is to give you eternal life whereby you're not deceived by that wicked one who's going to play that he is Jesus. 
He will act like Jesus. He even appears on the white horse in prophecy. You'll find in the sixth chapter to deceive the world. See that you're not a part of the world, but a Christian, which is a follower of Christ, the true Christ, not the fake. So again, that verse 9 brings a lot of consternation to those that, um, that uh, do not understand God's word and brings trouble to our brother Judah, but that's not who it's talking about. Jesus made that very clear. Again, a child can understand he was talking about the Kenites. Returning to chapter 2, the great book of Revelation, the unveiling, verse 10. Listen carefully. Fear none of those things which, they shall, which uh, thou shalt suffer. Don't, don't ever let them see you sweat. Okay. We've got it made. Never show fear. Behold, the devil, who, who is that now? The devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I will give you that crown of eternal life and a position right by the throne. It's called election. This ten days, is, this is the, one of the only places you'll find this in the Word of God. It is individual. It's not speaking. You will learn in the ninth chapter that the whole group of elect will have a five-month period that various ones will be tried. But God here is promising no one entity will have over ten days of trial before death. Well, who is death? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Christ came to this earth, died on the cross, whereby he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. So when you're delivered up before the devil in the role of Antichrist, then at that time you cannot have more than ten days trial. God looks out for his own. Well, that frightens me a little. Don't fear. You know, a coward dies a thousand deaths, and a brave man dies only once. So when you know that the Father of light is over you and he never allows anything to cast a shadow between you and he, which is a simple way of saying I'm always there for you, why should you fear anything? You have his attention. As it is written in one place, your angel has the face of God at any time that uh, you need him. Uh, and, and so it is speaking to God's elect, not just anyone, but one of God's elect, those that know the truth, and, and God intends to use them. But what is this trial? Many of us, well, I don't understand that. Well, ha have, you, um, have you never read the book of Mark? The Hour of Temptation? You need to know it. You need to know what this trial is and why you don't have anything to fear. Mark chapter 13, verse 9, listen to the trial. This is where Jesus was giving them. He gives all seven trumps right here, you know, to letting you know what each of them are, the seven seals and the seven vials, quite frankly. And uh, it's for you to decipher. But this is where many have a destiny. So listen to the trial. This is what happens, where Christ has just said, don't ever let a man deceive you, because many will come in my name claiming to be a Christian preacher. But you better listen to my words, what Christ says. Verse 9, Mark 13. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, that's Sanhedrin's, and in the synagogues. You shall be beaten, browbeaten, okay, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Well, who, my sake, Christ's sake. You don't have anything to fear about. For a testimony against them. That's what the whole purpose is, is that when God's elect are delivered up and tried, do you know what's going to happen? Well, listen to it. One more verse, verse 10. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. Well, you mean I'm going to deliver the gospel? Well, you're going to be there, but somebody's going to do the talking for you. Listen to this, verse 11. But when they shall lead you, 
and deliver you up. Take no thought beforehand what you will speak. You shall speak. Neither do you premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour. Well, what hour is that? The hour of temptation, of course. That speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit speaks through you. That's why how the gospel gets published to the whole world. That's how when you warn people that the false Christ is coming first and they see you delivered up and the Spirit speaking through you, as it is written as it is written in Luke chapter 21, even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say because it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit speaking through you because these, this gospel must go all the way around the world from the very mouth of God, the mouth of Christ, that is to say. That two-edged that two -edged sword that comes from his mouth cuts both ways, but it's sort of the most healing thing in the world. The truth always heals. There you have it, and, uh, and so it is. And many people wonder, well, I wonder what God wants me to do. Well, read the Word. Many people have a destiny. What an opportunity. What a time to live. Now, it's a blessed time to live. Verse 11, And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh will not be hurt, of the second death. The second death is the death of the soul. Why? Because you live eternal. You march right into paradise. I mean, right there at the feet of Christ and has have overcome the world and everything in it that is evil and gained eternal life in a beautiful world. How precious it is. <clears throat> Do you have ears to hear? Well, hear what? Hear the word of God. It's not man's word. It's God's promise. That is one of the churches that he found nothing wrong with. Does your church teach what that church teaches? If it doesn't, you're in a heap of hurt. Verse 12, returning to chapter 2, the great unveiling revelation. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, uh, write, uh, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. And, and uh, here, here we go. This, this means hype. I mean, we're right up there with the best of them, okay? But again, this is one of the failures. 13, I know thy works. At least they got that. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, have you ever read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses uh, 4 through 6? That tells you where Satan's seat is, right in Jerusalem. Okay. You've got to come with me to the, to the uh, Lord's Day, first day, to know. Just, and just prior to that, you see him sitting there claiming to be Christ. Okay, That's where his seat is. And thou holdest, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr. What, what, what is Antipas? You, you've got to really understand. Well, you know, what does it mean in the Greek? It means anti-father. Okay. Th that one that was against the one that claims to be father. Not the true father. Who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. And... and uh, he would like to call, bring a spiritual death to many people. You know, he doesn't care so much about your flesh death. He wants your soul. He wants to cause you a spiritual death. That's heavy stuff, my friend. You, you don't want that. And we're talking here about those, I mean, on home base that stand against the false one. Verse 14, listen carefully, though. I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Well, what's, the, what's the doctrine of Balaam? They like to preach for money rather than God's word, truth. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. 
preaching for money and not caring about the real delivery of God's word. You know, you you um, it is a sad thing that old Balaam, that God's angel, God's own personal angel, had to appear, and it was his ass that turned around and stopped Balaam for going to collect money that he thought he was doing right by. And, and um, use that. And when God has to use an animal to talk to a, to a priest, that's sad stuff. He himself speaks to us in his word. Have you read it? Have you read it with understanding? Have you read it with ears to hear? The simplicity in which Christ brings forth his word. No, this church also he has somewhat against. It's very obvious. 15, it continues. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. You know, remember back in verse 6 to that particular church? Um, but this thou hast, that thou hatest, ha hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate also. Well, these were went for it. Okay. So they've all got a little tilt here. But you better wake up. You better analyze and you'd better do some separating in your own mind. Because if you, as much as we learned in the second epistle of John, if you, as much as wish a fake Godspeed, you become a partaker of their evil deeds, and you will pay for it. When you know, if you, if you know better. If you don't know better, hey, have a good trip. What does he say then, continuing 16? Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, my word will tear them up. I will use it as a weapon. Verse 17, a promise. Listen carefully. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. I don't know, have you received it? Do you understand it? What is manna? Well, manna is what came from God that fed them, a real food from God. When it hit, what, what does manna mean? It means that's that. What, what's that? It's the word, the truth of God's word. And... Well, how could we reckon it? We've been reading it verse by verse, letting Christ do the teaching, whereby all we have to do is open our minds, our ears, our eyes, and see the spiritual truth that Christ would have you have knowledge of, whereby you're not deceived by the wicked one. He even identifies who the wicked one is, tells you, tells you where he's going to be if you come with me to that first day of the millennium to know and look around you to see the workings of that synagogue of Satan in these end times especially. It's very obvious. Now, there is another beautiful thing in this verse um, and this promise that will give him a white stone. This is, this is, there is such a deep truth hidden within this and I insist that you receive it. This word stone, this white stone, means purity, of course. But it is the sister word to a word you're going to find in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, that says, count the number of the beast, count the number of the fake. The word count means stone also, okay? And I'll even give you the, in your Greek dictionary of your Strong's Concordance, it's, it's the word 5585 and 5586. Say false. So, okay. It means to enumerate counting stones worn smooth over a long period of time, meaning you watch those Kenites. Tyrus is the fake rock, not our rock. But you are given uh, the verification, to the knowledge to know how to count, to cast lots and identify the wicked to cast lots and to recognize through that manna, that truth from God, who the enemy is, whereby you are not deceived by them. 
th there is, a, 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 again, you, we, we'll talk more of this when we come to the 13th chapter of this great book of Revelation. But I want you to make a note also of Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9, where there is a stone there in the Old Testament. You know what? It's got seven pairs of eyes, which is symbolic of the 7,000 of God's elect that see the truth, know the truth, hear the truth, and hang on to that truth were chosen before the foundations of this world even. Why? Because they didn't rebel. They would not follow Satan then, and they're sure not going to follow him now. They're too sharp for him. Because they can count. They can count the stones. And that very stone, as it is in Zechariah 3, if you read on in 4, Pretty soon you get that stone on the end of a plumb bob that t keeps you straight and narrow, tells you, lets you know how to divide, to conquer, to keep in line, to follow God's Word, to see truth, to hear truth, to know truth, and to be able to recognize it when you receive it. Our Father teaches many wonderful things in His Word. And there is a true rock, and there is a fake rock. There is a true Christ, there is a fake rock, uh, Christ. You've got to know the difference. And, and there is a morning star that is true, and there is a morning star that is false. Do you know what his name is? Let's say it in the Hebrew tongue, Lucifer. Okay. Bright morning star, Lucifer. Well, I always thought that was Jesus. Well, he thinks he is too. You know the difference, because I guarantee you, he's coming first. So that's why that these terminologies and these truths are self-evident, that once you absorb them, just turn your television on and watch news for a day or two. You can see it. It's happening around you because you've been taken to that day, just, I mean, the first day of the millennium, and are being able to look back and see what's transpiring, the deception, the false ones and the true ones. But most of all, the hidden manna, which is to say the truth of God's Word feeding your mind and spirit and soul, whereby you're not deceived. Do not miss the next lecture on these churches. Which one do you belong to? Think about it. Well, you don't go by name. You go by content of what's being taught there. Does your church teach who the Kenites are? You need to know and how dangerous Satan's children can be. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Uh, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. We have a judge. It's our Father. And he does not need our help in judgment. You have the right to spiritually discern what, who you should fellowship with and who you should not. But don't judge. That, that's wrong. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Uh, always a pleasure. You got a prayer request? You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Your father 
knows what you're thinking right now. Your heavenly Father is the Father of light. And that light shines down upon you when you want to receive that light. Always welcome it into your home, your family, and yourself. Per sip of that manna whereby it enriches your life and shows your destiny. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. All right, and we continue on then with questions, and we're going to go with Matthew, and don't know where Matthew's from. Whose soul is within Adam and Eve? Well, their own. Everybody has their own soul. I, this is one of the reasons that I like to translate soul as self. I know that's an oversimplification, but call it whatever you want to. It's yourself regardless of what body you're in. And everyone in the first earth age had their soul self right with them. And when God said, let us create man in our image, he meant in ourselves, our soul. So they had their own. Nobody else's. Mark from North Carolina. Did Jesus teach against organized religion? If so, where does that leave a lot of them out there that are denominational organizations? Well, we, again, I don't want to judge any of them. And denom de to denomination, uh, the, the word denomination means to divide. It does that. And, but uh, thank God for everyone there is. There's got to be some good. You, you will notice one thing, though Christ was not pleased with those churches, he did recognize what they did do that was good, but he sure warned them they better repent if they're not into the truth because that's, that's, that brings about a heap of hurt. But um, uh, Christ did not, uh, we're teaching uh, today God's word, Christ's word to the seven churches. So you kind of can decide for yourself, okay? Mike from Arkansas, my son is 30 years old and has told me he is not a Christian, but he believes in God. It doesn't make any sense. I need some help. What can I do? Well, um, you live and believe and let it be known that you do believe in Christ and set the example. You'll be blessed. He won't. Pretty soon he'll notice that and then he's, it will automatically draw him to that truth. That's, that's the best thing you can do. And when he asks you a question, be ready to answer it from the very word itself, if at all possible. But just uh, live as you live. But remember, uh, at the same time, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29. Never is a father's teeth set on edge but if the child bites a, a um, sour grape, okay? So, or vice versa. No one answers for anyone else's sins they answer for themselves. So you pray for him and set the example, and and uh, I'm sure you raised him right. He, he won't be too far from that line. Darlene from Kentucky. Is it okay to ask God to show you a sign, or is that testing God? Well, you know, I think you, God doesn't put on any side shows. You can ask for a fleece. Um, that that's happens many times. But always do this. Make a, make a note. Isaiah 43, 26. What does Isaiah 43, 26 say? It's, it's our Father himself really leveling with you. If you really want to feel his emotions, he says, remind me of my promises. Now God knows what they are, but he, he wants you to remind him of his promises. Let's talk about it so that I can justify you, meaning I can do right by you what is just. So that's the best sign you can have, is to communicate with him, and whichever promise it is that he has made, that's why you study his word, is in part, is to know those promises. Claim it. Okay. Go to him with it. He says, I want you to talk to me about it. 
You don't have to have another soul around. You don't even have to say it out loud. But talk to him. He wants you to. Let's reason together here. And so I can justify you. So really what is our father saying? And he's saying, hey, I want to know you've studied my word. I want to know that you know what my promises are before you start asking for something. I want you to know whether I've promised it or not. If I didn't promise it, probably you better ask for it. But I want to know first that you studied my word. And you can't blame him for that. He's your father, and he wrote you the letter. Joanna from Texas, can you marry again after you've been married one time, or is that committing sin and adultery? You know, not, not everyone holds with me in my opinion on this. If I did not believe that Jesus Christ could forgive sin, I would stop teaching him today. But I know that Jesus Christ forgives sin. I know that Jesus Christ washes you as clean as white as snow, where there is no infringement, there is nothing wrong, and everything is right. And once you repent, past sins are totally, completely washed away. Therefore, how could anyone, and inasmuch as we know the truth sets you free, how could anyone put you in bondage to say you would be committing adultery if you fell in love all over again with someone? that was holy and, and um, a good relationship. You couldn't, okay? I, I, I could not teach Christ that wouldn't be a, a forgiver of sin as he promises he is, because I know he does. So, therefore, I have to say, if you've been married, maybe it wasn't even your fault. Maybe you don't have anything to repent of. But if you, even if you had part of it, and it usually takes two to tangle, Repent and ask God's forgiveness and be washed clean as slow, snow, and then let God lead you, okay? Juanita from Georgia, are there any prophets in our time now? Can you explain this, or are there scriptures I could refer to? Oh, you bet. I just referred to one, one of the greatest prophets of all time, Isaiah. He's today. None of our prophets are dead. They're all with our Father. And our Father is the one that gave him the word to start with, and our Father is very much alive today. He's with us always. Now, as we're making this study, and as we studied in Mark chapter 13 today, as we made that reference, that trip, and the Holy Spirit spoke through those people, that's prophecy. Okay. This is why it's written in Acts chapter 2, and in the great book of, um, uh, in, in the Old Testament of, um, uh, of the great book of Joel, chapter 2, that my sons and my daughters shall see visions prophesy okay, in the end times. But that's after the false Christ appears, when Mark 13 comes to pass. Then we will have prophets today again, okay? Do... Uh, we have many that like to go around claiming to be a prophet, okay. and, and they mislead people many times. I do not judge anyone. You have the Word of God, something that doesn't fit, then I would read Mark uh, Ezekiel chapter 13 where God said, you've got a lot of prophets that claim to be, but I didn't send them. They didn't hear from me. So you want to be aware of those people. Joe from West Virginia, Pastor Murray. In Revelation 6, 2, who is on the white horse? Is it the Antichrist or Christ himself? I appreciate your program very much. Thank you for always teaching. Well, you're so, you're so welcome. I enjoy teaching. You see, this is, this is a good question, and this is why you want to know truth, because that white horse and rider in Revelation 6, 2 is none other than the fake, the Antichrist. And he's coming in just exactly as people expect Christ to return. That white steed. I mean, and, and, but the Greek is very specific. It says the bow that's around him, meaning the rain, it should be a rainbow, like the prism of light, the Shekinah glory around Almighty God or in the sun when they appear. It's a cheap fabric uh, toxon in the Greek. Imitation. He's a fake, and that's who it is. We'll be there in just a few days. Hang on.
Kim from Nevada. Pastor Murray, when the fallen angels come to earth, will I be more vulnerable because I am a single mother? How can I protect myself? It's real easy. You, you do what, what the Word tells you to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. When the fallen angels, because of the angels, a woman should keep her head covered with what? With Christ. Once you have Christ over your head, you have power over those fallen angels. In the name of Jesus Christ, you can tell them, lie to shuck. They know what lie to shuck means, okay? Real good if you do it in Christ's name. And they have to run from you. Again, I'll repeat the scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10. Uh, don't know where this is from. Where can I, or who it is, where can I find the Ten Commandments in the Bible? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 gives you all ten of them. The first five are spiritual. The second five are, are civil. Linda from California. Pastor Murray, since studying with you, I no longer feel the Spirit in my church because the they barely touch on the Word of God. Should I leave the church? God bless you and thank you. Well, you're so welcome, but I, I never tell anyone. You see, I, I believe God controls His elect. And God may have a purpose for you there. It may be that some individual is going to ask you a question sometime and a seed planted. But if it comes to the point that it, you are offended because of no teaching, or teaching that you know should be taught, then that would, if, I, if it were it I, I would not waste time. But um, that's, you have to make that decision. I never, never tell anyone where they should or shouldn't go to church. Because I believe God's in control. I truly do. I believe that with all my heart, that he tells each of us and leads us as to where we should be. And um, you, might, you might remember the little study we just did in the second epistle of John, and think about that one. You, do, you sure don't want to fall into that uh, guilt. Uh, Pastor Murray, Maryland from Georgia. Thank you so much for your teaching. You're welcome. I lost my vision about a year ago, and I prayed for someone to read and explain my Bible to me. That's when I found you. Thanks again. You're so very welcome. I also lost two of my children, and thanks to you, I still believe and am learning. Well, our condolences, and we know where they are. Our Father loves our children. He sure does, and it's good to have you with us. Uh, Jimmy from Kentucky, Jimmy, you did real good. We're sorry about your loss, and, and um, you handled it real well. I'm proud of you. You hang tough. Walter from Virginia, document cremation in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. This flesh body goes back to dust. It doesn't matter how it gets there. Daniel from Illinois. Where in Peter does it talk about the earth ages? Well, we just covered that in the last lecture. 2 Peter chapter 3. It gives you all three earth ages and all three heaven ages. There's only one heaven, and there's only one earth. When we speak of this erets, this terra firma, and uh, th that's what God is concerned with in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. All right there. There are many other places that the earth age before this one. You see, there's many people fall short in teaching God's word. When, when they say God's Word states this earth is only 6,000 years old, that's false. This particular dispensation of time is only 6,000 years old. But the Bible very clearly there was a, states there is a dispensation of time before this one. And you know something? We have artifacts that document it. I mean, we have actual facts that um, the earth is millions of years old and the Bible says it. Joseph from Missouri, what is unleavened and leavened bread? Well, of course, uh, unleavened bread is bread that has no yeast in it, therefore it does not rise. 
the reason that God told them not to use leaven, it takes time for, for yeast to work in, in the dough. You got to give it time to rise. And when the death angel was coming and Passover was near, they didn't have time, that much time. Therefore, the leaven signifies sin. Yeast signifies sin. And you leave that out of your house um, through that time. Kevin from um, New York. Was Noah a son of Adam and Eve? Well, he, he was in that genealogy, but there, there, he would be a... Um, about seven times a uh, great, great uh, grandson, okay? But he was definitely of that uh, generation, yes, uh, genealogy. Steve, uh, you can read it in Genesis chapter 4, uh, right down to, from, from Adam all the way down to Noah. There is one you will not find in Adam's genealogy, and that's Cain, because he wasn't Adam's son. I know a lot of people, because they don't understand the Hebrew, let 4-1 confuse them, bless their hearts. It says that Eve gave, knew her husband and gave birth to one son who she had already conceived, but then it says she, in verse 2, she continued in labor and bare another son, <clears throat> meaning they were twins, but by different... Um, Cain is not in Adam's genealogy. Noah is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Steve from Illinois. If you can't pay your tithes and get your medicine too, what should you do when you're on a fixed income? Well, you have to have your food and medicine, and then you tithe on what you have left over after you get it all done. If you don't have anything left over, you don't have anything to tithe. So don't let somebody put you on a guilt trip. You only tithe when, when you have a profit. If it takes more than you've got to live on, then um, I, I, a, lot of, a lot of people really get upset at me for saying that. But this falls in, in, in a condition where you give a love offering then. If it, if it really bothers you, you really, how, what is 10% of zero? 10% of zero is zero. Okay, so don't let somebody put you on a guilt trip. But if you have that love in your heart that you want to, the little widow woman that gave two mites, okay, well, just, just a little love offering then. But um, after, only after food and medicine, all right. Um, Marguerite from, from Georgia, where can I find scripture saying in these last days people would be calling right wrong and wrong right? Well, it's, it's more than one place. Uh, one of the favorite places I, I like is uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, where it speaks after the false Christ appears. For those that do wrong, he praises them. And those that do right, he condemns them. Uh, kind of along that line. That'll help you get started. Roger from Ohio. I would like more information on generational, generational or racial curses. Is there such a thing? Absolutely not. It's a real sad thing. Somebody asked earlier, where are the Ten Commandments? Well, they're in Exodus 20. And when you read in Exodus 20 concerning um, the offspring, it, there is one place there where it says, God hates them even to the tenth generation that disobey God. Generation didn't have anything to do with it. The verb is they hated God. And I don't care if it's a thousand generations. If they still hate God, he's not going to be happy about it. That's just common sense. So, uh, uh, and as I, as I used uh, just a moment ago, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29 one sin cannot fall on another. So if somebody's giving you that generational stuff, it's a bunch of malarkey. God loves all of his children that love him. God's unhappy with all the children that do not love him. Mike from Georgia. My son is dating a girl who doesn't believe in anything. My son's soul, is my son's soul in danger? 
Well, he may have a little bit of a problem, but um, you see, let's don't judge the girl totally. If your son, if you raised him right, uh, he may bring her around. God may be using him to convert that girl, or that girl may be leading him astray. But, but I hope you raised him right. But um, you know, everyone must uh, bear their own burden to a degree. You know, I think you've probably done a good job in raising him, Mike, and. I think he'll do what's right, and maybe he'll save that girl. Maybe she'll turn out to be really a blessing to him. Let's pray about it and think about it, but you'd always be there for him so that he knows that you're there and in good standing. Uh, Patricia from North Carolina, when, when Abraham bought the land uh, or a field which, with the cave on the land and he paid the money for it, Sarah died, okay, I know, see where you're coming. And he, the names that are buried there make an acrostic. Yes, they do. Israel, Isaac, Sarah, Rebecca, Abraham, and Leah. And you ask, what about the E? In ancient Hebrew, one of the things that makes it very difficult to translate is there's no vowels. You have to add them. And therefore, it leaves room for error unless you're pretty sharp at it. So. E uh, it needs nothing for it is a valve and was not even in the, uh, the, the, the language. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. He sure does. It makes his day when you do the letter from him. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Most of all, though, you listen to me. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, Call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 1.46, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world it was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How was the what? How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. 
Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, book of Deuteronomy. What, what a fascinating book that Moses, this is the fifth of book in the Pentateuch, okay? And it will be the last of Moses' books. In the last chapter of this great book, Moses will leave us, and I feel that probably most of the book was written 30 days before his passing. So it's kind of a re 